Um, hi everyone. Okay. Uh, my name is Vodwa Skei uh, and I am an aspiring curator. I'm doing my master's at Pretoria Studies at Royal University. Um, so, um, Okay, so um, so I work um, with Eastern Cape Bead Workers. Um, so the Eastern Cape local creative production is dominated by Kassel women crafters, whose particular focus is bead work, which is important not only as an economic benefit to them and their communities, but also as a social creative practice that preserves their histories and expresses their cultural experiences using storytelling and song. My curatorial practice explores the significance of voice and visibility in the works of Kosa women crafters from the Eastern Cape, and in the process finds ways of reading and displaying indigenous art. My work explores through curating the social, cultural, and labor conditions that lead to the perceived voicelessness and lack of agency in the craft work of Kosa women who, worked, who work in community art centers. But I work with two groups of women, um, from these um, centres in the Eastern Cape, one from Gombo Community Arts Centre in East London, um, and the other one is um, Namzan Old Age Centre in Elita Township in King Williamstown. My research attempts to locate communities and highlight their voices and agentic positions by using various collaborative methods, methodological approaches in curating the exhibitions and in writing up my thesis employing a process of disseminating knowledge and of ensuring that research reaches the people who have helped make it. To facilitate a decolonial approach where both the research and the research benefit equally. Because the women, women's work is referred to as craft rather than fine art, it is mostly channeled towards craft shops and markets, which cater to tourists and is therefore presented as silent objects with the content of the work and the individuality of the craft removed in favor of a collective, anonymous social identity. The works would better articulate their intended meanings in alternative spaces where their voices would be able to be given enough volume to be heard, and the creators of the works more economic freedom to benefit further from their productions. My research also looks at the craft sector of the Eastern Cape, which is largely dominated by Trossoman, and examines early African art paradigms as they intersect with anthropology and missionary art centers to watch the development of the labor of craft and fine art that stereotype black creative works in particular hierarchical ways does so today. Um, given that the, the women also work um, from community art centers where further restrictions are imposed upon them once again in terms of agency and autonomy, I examine the structures of power that determine the kind of work that comes out of art centers, both conceptually and aesthetically, and the platforms in which these works are received by the public. Art centers, according to South African writer and curator, please, where they serve um, the dual purpose of, on the one hand, providing the tourists with idealized pictures about the region culture being visited, while on the other being the primary outlet for artists in the region to show their work. Especially so in the Eastern Cape, these kinds of institutions often use this dual purpose to control the region's creative output. A phenomenon that often deeper describes as frequently calling on African women to play the role of ventriloquist puppets, speaking to other people's agendas. I look at the importance of space in relation to visibility in my territorial practice, focusing on alternative spaces to the usual art gallery space. Um, using the concept of Imbongi, which is a Tosa um, praise poet who introduces um, usually kings and queens, and but also has the license to question and direct community communities that they serve. I collaborate with the women in elevating their work, voices within their work, giving them the freedom of Imbongi and articulating their social conditions by linking their voices to earlier and present Eastern Cape born female in Wolby and trickster characters who were and are women killed by poets who defined the limits set on their voices during the time, and employ collaborative, innovative, curatorial experiences 
working with the crafters in collecting their stories and wisdoms and representing them using Molara if Open Diva's code um, in the sites and forms in which their voices are acted. The women's work is inspired by three killjoy poets and storytellers from the Eastern Cape. Lindsay is in Puerto, as a Trosa poetess was the first Trosa woman to publish this Trosa poetry. During the 1920s, after finding restrictions in rural Eastern Cape um, life, um, deliberating for her work, who could not perform a poetry based on the fact that she was a female, sought out the help of Charlotte and um, Marshall McClendon, who at the time had been the editor of the East of Cosmo newspaper, Winter to Labor Land, to publish her work and let it be heard in a different platform. Um, in the same way, Nuno Nini Lema Statu Zenani, a storyteller from the Eastern Cape, um, who told story, stories during the 1970s, um, who recorded stories um, on the positionalities um, of women um, within social society and cultures. And then the, the third person would be Umu Sinkyo Adana, who is a well-known musician, a uh, contemporary musician, who with albums like Sandy Sila and um, the One Love Movement on Martin Hill Street, uses poetry to bring awareness to social, political issues affecting black people in contemporary South Africa. Where previously their voices had been muted by social structures, lack of resources, and the marginalities of their communities, all three women took bold steps in altering the status quo and inserting their individual voices into mainstream platforms to access a wider audience. By engaging with the ancient art of processing, storytelling, and poetry in oral literature, the women attempt to make their voices heard by disrupting the norms of the contemporary South African art sector in finding new ways of speaking, both in creative and the, in the creation and the presentation of their work. They are all grandmothers um, and are therefore storytellers like most, almost all Tosa grandmothers. And it's always the best way for them to speak, it's only being um, a word for a Tosa story. Like women in as a man to engage with their communities, they use story. In Tsomi is not only a source of entertainment for the young and old, but is also, according to Dr. Tsai, an important medium in which wisdom and philosophy is stored and transmitted. And, is also, and it is mainly from these texts that um, African perceptions of the past can be gleaned. So in different genres of, of oral tradition, constructed and stored are beliefs and values which in turn reflect the, the world view of a people. The use of Umapulu, the grandmother, and its own in my territorial work allows for a much freer um, platform for them to discuss and um, articulate their processes and provides easier solutions to ways of engaging with indigenous art and in, in, in exhibitions and written publications. It also provides new ways of constructing and communicating knowledge in decolonial indigenous fashions. Um, so I'm just gonna like um, I um, I left my stick that has the last pictures, so I'm just gonna show you the ones, um, just so you know what it is that I'm doing. So these are the ladies that I work with. Um, they're from two different art centers. Um, so we do um, workshop workshops on beadworking, but we also during the process of beadwork, this is where you kind of gauge the the meaning that's embedded in the work. Um, so here we're having a kind of a conversation slash workshop, uh, very informal, but also, um, yeah, you, you clean up the information of how to display during um, exhibitions and, and how to talk about the work, um, hearing from how they talk about it during the process. Um, thank you. Take care of Temple Auntie is a kind of <laughs> snapshot 
uh, vignette, and it's based on my MA thesis, which is called Burning Breaking and Finding My Way Back to God. So it's a fair burning temple. So the video that's played behind me is um, uh, an online residency I did with Floating Regularly, and I kind of made images and um, you know wrote these long captions that kind of spoke to aspects of my research. So I thought it would be kind of an interesting visual distraction for me talking to look at some of the things that I've made. <laughs> um, I also um, enjoy kind of being out in public space and getting my research out there in a more accessible way. So I use some of um, my skills making online collages and making paste and kind of disrupting the, the usual visual culture of walking around Joburg and seeing advertising. But now you see um, these eyes that are staring at you and you might not know exactly what they mean, but they in some way um, go back to my research, which has to do with domestic violence and care, as well as how religious organizations, in particular um, Hindu temples, um, can facilitate um, caregiving or kind of act as quite alienating to survivors of domestic violence. So um, my research was composed mainly of field work, so I did interviews with um, survivors of abuse, um, I did participant observation, as well as um, general life observations of what's going on in Berlin and my family coming from Berlin. Um, the field site was the Sri Sivasubramanya Adyam, which is a temple in Berlin, which is a formerly Indian area in the northern coast of KZN. Um, and when I was doing my field work, I was staying with my grandmother and these old aunties and ayahs were talking in Tamil and Hindi. <laughs> and my grandmother was actually my companion in my research. She was the one translating and trying to also um, help me understand uh, some practices and some spiritual beliefs because coming from being a young uh, a young woman who didn't grow up going to temple every single Sunday, I wasn't completely aware of all of the different um, elements and layers to different understandings of Hinduism. So as I alluded to, my research is about old women. It's about old women who clean the temples and play harmoniums and are basically the invisible backbone of Hindu temple culture in South Africa and I'm sure the world over. Um, and these women are affectionately or chidingly known as temple aunties. And sometimes the women themselves call themselves a temple auntie and kind of wear that with, with pride to say, yes, this is my role in the larger ecosystem of the community. And other times, younger people will kind of use that as like, oh, you know, like being an auntie, being a temple auntie. So, um, one big aspect to this research, and I found out the more I did field work was um, indentured labor and indentured labor system. And um, I realized that care and domestic violence were deeply intertwined with understandings of morality, of family, um, of who deserved care and who didn't deserve care, and also the ways that official temple Hinduism as practiced in the field site I was at. Um, implicitly rely on figurations of Tamil womanhood from Hindu scripture, as well as um, the way that matrilineal indentured forebears had endured violence and had suffered through um, kind of the double violence of both um, their multiple partners and other indentured laborers, as well as colonial officials and plantation masters. And so that um, understanding that you need to be a strong woman to survive and so, yeah, so I, I, I was kind of looking at that. So, um, a little bit about family and Indigenous tradition. Um, Brian and the side of the right in the kind of seminal work on Indian Indigenous South Africa state that the search for family or some form of close kinship structure was one of the most powerful but under researched responses of the Indigenous. Um, they state, Traditions imagined in India are reimagined in a new setting. At, this, at the same time as tradition was being reimagined and inverted in many cases, culture and religion were continuing there. The Indian community was not built in local, it often relied on myths and memories of back home. 
So for the mainly um, single male migrants who are bought the first ships carrying indentured laborers, um, one of the kind of um, most important aspects of being back home was the patriarchal extended family structure for some sense of kinship or having a partner or having a child or um, being in, in some sense of community. But because of the gender imbalances on the ships that initially came, um, family making was complicated because of this. Uh, as well as the fact that um, the colonial officials in Cosmo Natal um, didn't have any laws pertaining to marriage, divorce, adultery, dowry, polygamy, um, or any of that when the Indonesia first arrived because they didn't envision units of labor needing human things. <laughs> they envisioned the population who would just go back to India. So um, they, the Indonesia population operated in all of the vortex of legislation on kinship for a while. Um, as far as the side um, note, migration restructured gender relations. Um, if we add to the gender imbalance the dependence of women on men for rations, then the ability of some women to earn an independent income, mainly as sex workers, so ending their dependence on men, combined with the absence of kinship networks and a lack of recognition of Hindu and Muslim marriages, this in part explains why relationship between indentured men and women were brought for tension and violence. Um, so, sorry. <laughs> so, um, one of the, I guess, the scariest as well as really exhausting parts of my research was going through pages and pages and pages of the most horrific stories of men enacting patriarchal violence on women. And this was the kind of variety of men, whether it was on ships coming to South Africa, whether it was plantation masters, whether it was a casual sexual partner, whether it was the father of someone's child, and just really intense stories of stabbing and hitting and murdering. And in my mind, I don't know if you are familiar with the Post newspaper, but they usually have, it's, a, it's an Indian tabloid in case it is, and they usually have a front page of some kind of love triangle or love plot. And reading the colonial documentation and looking at the high rates of murder-suicide, it kind of, there was a little bit of similarity in the way that the post, and in the tone of, of the post covering these love murders, and kind of tracing it back to the colonial archives in the way that um, the Kuli Commission and the Rai Commission also had these certain understandings of um, kinship and intimate relationships between Indian men and Indian women in place of them. Um, so as much as there was high levels of sexual violence and domestic violence, and this was something that colonial officials were worried about themselves because their units of labor were not performing as well as they should have on the plantation, um, feminists have kind of reread the color family to see um, so the Kalapani is the name for the journey from India across the ocean. Um, it means the dark of black waters. So feminist readings of the Kalapani um, see women as migrating to escape the patriarchal gender order in India, as well as their subordinate positions within it. Migration presents an opportunity for women to renegotiate gender identities. But um, that's why I did this. I also note um, the indentured space was a dangerous site for trying to rupture the patriarchal order. And over time, the story would be of legislation to re-inscribe the gendered patriarchal order, or approximations of it, and re-institute the state of family. So um, what they're talking about in terms of rupturing the patriarchal order is that um, a lot of indentured Indian women at this time were engaging in casual sex work or having multiple um, partners, um, and this was because men were the ones who collected rations and they lived in compounds, and there's, there's a lot of reasons, but um, both colonial officials as well as attitudes from male indentured laborers was that women were immoral, and women were acting in immoral ways rather than women are acting in ways to secure their survival and their children's survival. Um, and so, as Vanna and the Sun knows, the stable, moral Indian family was brought in as a savior to the immorality or the perceived immorality of um, Indian women. 
So this was done through um, mainly the Cooley Commission, which regulated marriage laws um, and kind of fixed uh, women to men. So if you were married, you were married. And only much later on did divorce come into the picture. Although at this time, many um, indentured Indian women did want divorce, but it was not part of the, <coughs> the commission's purview to do that. So through um, all of these um, regulations, these colonial regulations, they prioritized a sense of Victorian morality, of submissiveness, of delicacy, and I'm sure if you kind of think to Indian women in the public sphere in South Africa and globally, you get that sense of it's an Ashwarya right, it's a beauty queen, it's a this, it's a that, and um, not a sense of um, kind of the, this being an immoral person. So um, by the 1890s, the gender imbalance um, had diminished significantly, which um, that and in conjunction to the regulations allowed many Indian families to take um, the form of an extended family. Um, the Fatima Mir, who was uh, kind of reflected on this period, noted how that normal structure of the Indian family in South Africa was rectified in the second decade of the 20th century when Indian family life in South Africa settled into traditional conservatism and women assumed full responsibility for maintaining that conservatism. The home was the bastion of Indian life, struggling against the foreign environment, surrounded by strong forces. It depended on its trustees for women. So that kind of goes back to what Patricia McClellan was saying about collusion and about um, why is it certain women will kind of collude with patriarchal violence and reinscribe these things within the domestic sphere, within their family networks, or within a temple. So coming into this recent, I definitely kind of looked at temple aunties as those custodians and those gatekeepers of tradition and of culture and, and um, through doing the research I realized that a lot of what they do you might not see um, on the surface but in their own ways they, they suffer those things. So, um, you have seven minutes. <laughs> still cool. Okay. Um, so the next thing I'd like to look at before looking at the kind of findings of my research is a little bit about Hinduism. Um, mainly because uh, when I was undertaking this research, I realized there was a lot about Christianity and a little bit more about Islam and how that pertains to um, how that pertains to um, the domestic space. Uh, intimate partner violence, uh, trauma, but there was relatively little when it came to Hinduism and especially Hinduism as practiced in the diaspora, which is what um, is happening currently in Hindu temples in South Africa. Um, so it's not really the point of the paper to go into the differences between Hinduism as practiced in India and Hinduism as practiced here, but suffice to say that it is a kind of it's a mixed masala, it's a prestige of things. <laughs> there will be certain practices where an Indian priest will come and kind of like, you know, shake his head at the South African congregation and be like, that's not how we do things. Um, for example, my grandfather was a butcher and technically he would people and I was supposed to eat beef for me, <laughs> but he was a butcher. So there's like various ways in which um, Hinduism is not as fixed, I guess, as it, as it would be in um, South Asia. So um, even though it's also not necessarily um, something I'll be looking into as much, but um, Hinduism as practiced in India and by the diaspora definitely can take on the face of a Hindu that like kind of fascism, which is what we're seeing coming up more and more and has been for many, many years. And the way in which Hinduism and nationalism are kind of these identity forming feelings, which I, I saw when I was doing my field work in particular. Um, these are important things to know about how they're not exactly what I'm going to be um, going further into. Um, then I noted that temples were a source of community bonding, uh, drawing on ancient skills, and providing the organizational backbone of Hinduism in Natal. Um, and, and part of that was kind of 
bringing a permanence and a, and a sense of being rooted or placed for the indentured population. Um, and something I found quite interesting, and Kathy doesn't go a lot, kind of goes more in depth into this, is about the creation of the Hindu Mahasabha, which is a kind of um, umbrella organization that uh, temples um, fall within. And uh, indenture ended in 1911, and the Mahasabha was created in 1912. So I find it quite interesting that around the time that um, the good Indian model family was being um, bolstered up and supported um, through certain regulation. Um, the Hindu Mahasara also came about as this um, kind of permanence, a source of permanence and reinforcing the, the, the institutionalization of Hinduism. Um, another thing to note about Hinduism, especially as practiced in Vietnam, um, which is a largely working class area and during the past age it was the Indian area, um, is this binary of uh, temple official Hinduism and backyard temple Hinduism. So um, basically, temple Hinduism is like structure and you go in and you have your very respectable Sunday service and um, there's usually a high caste priest, a Brahmin priest, um, who will be um, officiating everything uh, and they're usually a male um, temple trustees, which are like the custodians of the temple. And the backyard temple, and the lady Diesel has written prolifically on this, um, it's usually located in southern Indian um, Hindu beliefs, so in the Ahn tradition, Blavkadi, uh, Mariam, and Kali. Um, and these are usually run by women, and it's usually run in like the kitchen or backyard. Um, and a lot of official temple Hindu, uh, Hindu temple goers look down on backyard temple um, goers and they kind of look at it as more of a cult than, a, than an authentic and uh, valuable expression of Hinduism and that's definitely because temple aunties run it because all the women run it and they talk about um, a lady looks at how um, these women often talk about abuse of husbands and about having stupid children and like kind of you know just uttering a lot of unmaternal feelings in these spaces and using the scaffolding of um, the Amman tradition to kind of build up on that. So um, I really I wanted to kind of look further into that kind of temple but of course they could take their space really well and I didn't want to go into that space um, for this research but I decided to look at an official temple. Um, so I interviewed both temple trustees as well as um, um, domestic violence survivors. And the responses from, from both parties were basically like night and day. <laughs> they were completely different. Um, and the theme of the patriarchal nature of the practices of the temple emerged from the responses by the survivors of abuse and A, how they felt that um, they were alienated even prior to experiencing and being in abusive relationships. Um, they felt alienated because, for example, when you're menstruating, you can't go to the temple um, and people will snitch on you. <laughs> So um, that's like a, a big kind of um, barrier to them feeling safe and like I can, you know, chill here and I can be here and be myself if you're beating it out. Um, and um, another temple trustee member also offered the reasoning um, the temple doesn't care for abuse survivors or offer guidance or additional support to domestic violence or intimate partner by the survivors because it only affects and I quote no moral people. And I found it quite interesting because it kind of went back to this understanding of um, morality and this very strong Victorian moralism that was um, kind of forced upon the ways that families were formed um, during the tail end of the data. <laughs> um, the point of this is that um, the temple 
Um, the abuse survivors rely largely on their own personal resources to cope with their abuse. However, they did find some solace in cultivating personal relationships with deities and constituted new meanings to their religious belief. And that was through navigating Hinduism within their own house and with their family and with their children. Um, well, not their husbands, but their children. Um, and in effect, they relied on spirituality and Hindu faith to support them, but not necessarily through the institution of the temple itself. Um, as the participant said, self-made care was the primary mode of care that they relied on. This self-made care shows that how, despite the patterns of domination continuing from ancient times, the women I spoke to were determined to refashion their spiritual beliefs to serve them and to keep themselves and their children alive. So, who takes care of temple auntie? Temple auntie does. <laughs> to a Thursday, um, which was actually um, the, uh, the day for Mama Bumtandaz. So I'm going to stop taking that as a coincidence. Oh, Mama Bumtandaz are women of prayer. Um, a women from different churches come together um, and pray for their families and communities and so on and so forth. Um, so we're talking about um, constructions of femininity. I hope I'm not blocking you with my tallness uh, <laughs> what's happening behind me. Um, we're talking constructions of femininity um, by the charismatic church. Um, and uh, the charismatic churches, uh, you know, at 80% of South Africa actually identify themselves as Christian. Um, it's not clear how many of them actually attend to the church or are members of the church. But what we do know is that the charismatic church is actually the fastest growing in Africa. Um, you know, and, and has its, its different factions, but if you put them all together as a group, they do form the largest number um, of church members in Africa. So, um, now, so, can I use this one? Oh, okay. Um, so when we're talking about femininity, in my paper I actually go into an illustration of uh, my childhood and our upbringing with my sisters, where um, I say that our bodies were actually owned by our parents. So, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so they um, they managed our hair, and that's why that's the first thing that's why it's the first thing that I put up there. So where um, the, my, my one sister, who was considered quite defiant in her teenage years, had her hair cut off, you know, to just get her back into being a good girl, because we want good girls. Um, and the other was encouraged to grow her hair and be more feminine, because you can't be so good that you're not attracting boys. And, you know, and then uh, where, where with me, it was just a matter of, okay, we can't talk about hair because it doesn't grow at all. Let's get her wearing skirts rather and make sure that she's feminine in that way. And so then, but you know, obviously um, there are other things like our body, our behavior, the roles that we're supposed to play and um, we're taught how to enact all of these roles. Um, but we grow into adulthood and we, um, we, we sort of um, fit ourselves into spaces where we make our own choices but what we are going to describe to um, according to what our families um, have taught us and what we want for ourselves and what society maybe wants for us. But the paradox with religion is that women, even in their adulthood, when they have a, when they have a choice now of the kind of woman they want to be, actually then go on and give over ownership of these bodies to 
Um, in, in the case of charismatic Christianity, um, Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior, but essentially it's the, the prescriptions of what it, it means to be a woman are given by the leaders of the church, the pastors, um, their spouses, um, and, and, and whatever other um, leadership structures there are within the church. These are pictures of women uh, within my charismatic spaces, spaces I call the pop-up charismatic churches, uh, because they don't necessarily, um, they're not like mainline churches, they, um, they, they, they don't follow any specific theology, and if I, for instance, had a calling, um, and um, I wanted the world to know what God has placed in my heart, I could start a church here, you know, could hire the space, um, put you all as my congregants, and if you believe in what I have to say, then you're going to follow me. Um, um, so this is the sort of setup that you'll find. Um, you know, this is a community hall where you find charismatic churches um, hiring spaces. So um, now, these women, uh, and, and a lot of scholars have tried to go into why, why, why do they follow these churches so much? Why are they the greatest population in these churches? Um, and uh, we're coming to that, you know, um, a, a lot of middle class uh, women are, are in these churches, or at least a lot of women that want to learn um, or to embrace a middle classness are the ones who go to these churches, so it becomes a haven to them when they want to be more modern. Um, it's a space for them to talk about their domestic issues, and some would say convert men to domestication. I'm not sure where I stand on that, but yes, there are some talks of, no, men, good men, helps with the children at <laughs> home, so I guess that is the domestication that they're talking about. Um, and because charismatic Christianity talks a lot about um, healing, you know, um, as well, um, it said that they, these uh, women who are the main caretakers of their children and their home are attracted to this because they want to know how to heal their children, whatever uh, problems they may be going through, whether physical, mental, or spiritual. And this is my favorite. It's been called a movement that defines women's power within the biblical context. And some are saying that it's actually a feminist movement. And that's where, some of, that's where I now try to um, uh, ne negotiate the paradoxes that I'm finding in, the charis in charismatic Christianity. So this is um, as an ordainment, a uh, typical ordainment um, at a charismatic church. And as you can see, the people, who are, the people who are kneeling in the front there are actually the people who are being ordained, and two of them are women. Um, I, with my experience of charismatic Christianity, I've seen that, yes, it's a patriarchal space, but women are actually being given leadership roles now. But I, say, I think that it's because of the pop-up culture of the charismatic church. So it gives, it gives women um, a, a, a way to, to push through for leadership. Because if you keep on saying that women are not meant for leadership, the, the culture of the church allows those very women to stand up, leave the part of the congregation, and form their own church anyways. So they may as well be ordained, right? But then, the focus on spirituality by the charismatic church also means that genitalia shouldn't play that big a role in terms of where women and men stand. But then these women who are leaders of the church now take on the part of not only prescribing what femininity is to charismatic women, but also in acting and performing it for them. So the scripts of femininity um, that are followed, and, and I've looked at feminist readings and tried to balance them against what, what I see happening in the church, um, is that of firstly uh, something like respectability, uh, where there's a good Christian woman and a deviant Christian woman. Um, and, there's, and, and there's 
I, I, I'm going to say obvious, but maybe it's not obvious to a lot of people um, that there's a that it's that the the way that femininity is taught in the church uh, structure is very heteronormative. So they stress um, things like um, motherhood. Motherhood is your is your spiritual calling, which also uh, confuses career women because they think that they may be in their careers only because. Um, you know, because of economical issues, but that if God comes and blesses my husband, I can now leave this job and follow my true calling and be a good Christian mother as Jesus wants me to be. Um, and that of wifehood as a willing slave. And I'll explain that later when I talk about submission and the different stands that are taken on submission by um, charismatic leaders. I'm looking at this through the lens of uh, uh, what, um, ooh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her first name, but it's Masi her, her name is Masinia, um, who uh, turns it to Busari theology. Because she says that if we're going to find feminine spaces within the church, that we need to actually um, balance out the authority of the Bible and charismatic Christianity believes very strongly in the authority of the Bible and some theologians have even um, accused them of not being critical enough in their readings of the Bible, you know. So for instance, where um, that, that one scripture that feminists take to where Paul says, Corinthian women, sit down, shut up, you can't be in these spaces. But they actually take that very literally and not look at the context or what was happening, what was the space like. That the fact that it was probably over 2,000 years ago <laughs> and there is no current anymore, you know. Um, but, that, but, but she acknowledges that the, the Bible does have guiding principles and can be taken as the word of God, but that what should be foregrounded is the authority of black women's lived experiences. So, in reading the Bible, we should see it firstly and acknowledge its history of oppression, especially on the black woman's body. And then we should take the, 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 the current lived experiences of black women and now take liberating texts of the Bible and foreground those in order to give women their true space in society. How female leaders within the charismatic church um, use these guidelines or reject these guidelines. I've, sorry, I've said, I've, I've found binaries in, in um, and I'm, I'm saying it's a sustaining tradition or resisting tradition. And we could say sustaining patriarchy or resisting patriarchy because like I've said, even with female, um, with women rather, leaders within the charismatic church, um, there is a, a, a still uh, there, there is still a negotiation with patriarchy and a teaching women to, um, to to submit. So, for instance, um, when we look at at respectability, women are taught um, how to dress. So, the one female pastor that um, says. Um, which means um, I, I, I did not attract him with my legs, you know, so that's already a prescription in terms of the, the length of the skirt and how it is to be worn and that it's not respectable uh, for a woman to show her legs as much as I am, for instance. Um, and that you, that, that you should submit that women are expected to, to expect and accept this Christ-like love that men have for them through submission. But then you find more radical female pastors who answer the call to submission by saying, let's go back to the very beginning when God created man. He said, take dominance over the earth, the animals, the produce, the this, the that, not over another human being. So they're saying there is no submission. We should all respect each other as men and women. Um, they're also saying that a respectable woman will not allow tradition to hold her back. That a respectable woman will actually liberate her family. And the one pastor used an example of the wife of Moses. Um, not questioning that she doesn't have a name. 
that the wife of Moses um, once performed a circumcision. Um, and a circumcision is something that in, in, in many traditions is not supposed to be performed by a woman. But she argues that by performing this circumcision, she actually saved Moses and she saved their son. So she actually um, stood for Israel by doing something that is not that is traditionally not meant for women. So they are they are um, advocating for a resistance and a fight against the patriarchal structure. But now talking to the women um, themselves, um, and this is just ongoing conversations that I'm having with different groups of charismatic women. Um, and I ask them about the sermons, what, they, what it means to them, how they're using them to balance out their lives, what principles they're taking and not taking. And the general sense that I'm getting is that they believe in the liberation sermons that they're listening to, but they still have the sense that if we are going to be liberated, it must be at work. So you must get equal pay at work, you must get your promotion at work, but when you get back home, you're not trying to be too much of a feminist because you don't want to, you don't want the very male that um, you should be having children that should marry you and have children with you um, feel alienated by your feminism. Um, and I, I, I think it may be because there are a lot of uh, black women within uh, the Christian church who are actually not married. But the push that they're giving now is that, is in saying, we don't believe that we could get married if we're told, um, you know, uh, to, to dress in a certain way in a society where a sex is an attraction, we were told that we're not supposed to date because when we do enter dating spaces, we don't exactly know what to do to, to get these men. So there's already a cry out um, from, from the good girls that the bad girls are taking their men. So now they want the pastors to give them answers um, to this. Um, yeah, so I'm, so, so going further, I'm going to try to find out what the answers are for the good girls because they want marriage, but they also want to be good Christians. And also to find where um, we can find this um, sort of radical, um, uh, um, a, a, a biblical principle um, that, that, that fights for a true liberation for women and actually get to a point where it's said so many times that it's actually normalized and that the freedom of spirit that charismatic Christianity vouches for so much includes a freedom of the woman's body, of, of her mental state, and of her place in society. Thank you. We are keeping to the time. <laughs> First of all, sorry, I literally left my laptop at home, and, <laughs> and something fun happened at 3 o'clock this morning. I realized I was wrong, and I had to change my argument. <laughs> so, yeah, that's research work. Okay, so I titled this paper, The Power, the Myth, Magic, and the Culture Witch, a Critique of Europe, Modern Understanding of African Knowledge and Spiritual. Imagine you had power to bend your world to your will. Just think about it for a second. What would you do with this power? To bend your world to your will? Bend the world, the world to your will. Okay. What would you do with this power? What would you change right now? Maybe you would make every day Friday. Or maybe you would end this presentation part of the conference and start the art of proceedings. <laughs> well, Rekwane was such a man with power, with such a power. He lived in an undisclosed homeland and his life was not looking good. He had his fair share of problems, but through the help of his dead friend, Lucido, he was able to exact the great vengeance on his enemies. By blowing on his little horn, he summoned his zombie friend, Lucido, who was only visible to him. 
Uh, I would later learn that he was actually visible to him, ever blew the horn and summoned him, but whatever. Hopefully by now you'll have figured out that I'm referencing the early 90s classic, Lucille the Brown. The character of Red Hardy was stunningly portrayed by Mugite Boiki who won numerous awards for his portrayal. For me, Lucilo Rula, like many other portrayals of the occult media, represent a world where those in the margins of society have the power, or should I say, have a power. For me, no image is more powerful as the representation of the witch. Let's take the classic 1986 South African series, Shaka Ushaka was brilliantly portrayed by the late Henry Burnett, and Shaka would venture into the outskirts to visit the witch doctor, Sitani. It is through her powers of prophecy that we would learn the king's destiny. It is interesting that the makers of the Shaka series would take what was loosely read, or what I thought was a docu-series, and turn it into a Shakespearean drama. Because unfortunately there is no record of CAT, but boy does she make, boy does the character make for good television. This use of foreshadowing to tell a tale is also used in Macbeth. In Macbeth's first encounter with the three witches, he bellows, How now, you secret black and midnight hag, what is it you do? This is his first interaction with these women, yet his interaction is one of disgust. Through these words, Shakespeare conjures up a terrifying world from where they came. Such an insulting way to meet someone you don't know. And yet these women respond in the most badass, dismissive fashions. <laughs> when, <laughs> fashions. When asked what it is they do by Shakespeare, they respond, a deed without a name. <laughs> in this paper, I use the term which in an endearing sense of the word one whose meaning is reappropriated to represent peoples living on the margins of society, where very little is actually known of them, yet so much is spoken of them. The Bible says, Thou shalt suffer a witch to live. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Occult practices is the domain of the witch. It can be described, well, the occult can be described as the mystical, supernatural, magical powers, practices of phenomena. You can locate its history within the development of modern capitalism. Silva Federici's Caliban and the Witch traces the journey between the witch hunts and the transitions into a new capitalism in 16th century Europe. I have, yet, I have had to change my position in Federici's work in that I no longer think her method of analysis and ignores the beliefs of the victims of the hunt as previously stated in my abstract. What's a, what Federici does is show how the very occult beliefs, which she defines as magic, provided a world of knowledge and independence from the church and feudal authorities. She defines a changing world where roughly, where from, where from roughly 1450 to 1650, a feudalist European society was breaking down. Here, capitalist accumulation coexists with political formation that were not yet co-opted into a capitalist logic. Yet this process would happen through a new conception of the body, one which would require the destruction of pre capitalist beliefs and practices whose existence would contradict the process of regularization. Federici describes magic as being an animistic conception of nature that <coughs> did not admit any separation between matter and spirit, and thus imagine the cosmos, a living organism populated by occult forces where every element in its sympathetic relation, relation with, the, with the rest in this perspective, nature is viewed as a universe of signs and signatures, marking invisible affinities that needed to be deciphered. Thus, a variety of practices were designed to appropriate the secrets of nature and bend it to the world, up to the human world. There was a magic design to, win, design to win card games, to play unknown instruments, to become invisible, to win someone's love, to gain immunity war, to make children see. Eradicating these practices was a necessary condition for the capitalist rationalization of work, since magic appeared as an illicit form of power and an instrument to obtain what one, what one wanted without work. <coughs> that is a refusal to work in action. It is in this, it is in this setting that we see a process of social engineering where peoples are stripped of the agency of knowledge, once steeped in a history of cultures and communities to become a body to be used in the accumulation of wealth. 
Federici also makes reference to Shakespeare's The Tempest, whose character of Caliban epitomizes <coughs> the cruel effect of communities both in Europe and the New World. Even Shakespeare's Prospero insisted on this cruel economic fact in a little speech on the value of labor, which he delivers to Miranda after she manifests utter disgust with Caliban. But a tiss, we cannot miss him. He does make our fire. Finch, <laughs> in our Sebert and Sebert's serves an office that prophesies us. Mm -hmm. Yet this embodiment continues to this day. Maria Longone's in her work, Heterosexualism and the Colonial Modern Gender. In this work, she describes a global capitalist system of power that would, that would, enter, that would center the Europe, European cis male body in its conception of its cosmology. Here, colonialism would impose a different arrangement for colonized subjects and the colonizers. It is in the organization that introduces gender we can introduce gender as a colonial concept that would be used in the organization of bodies, in the production, property relations, cosmologies, and the ways of knowing. In this conception of gender, conception of gender, in this conception, gender is no longer naturalized. Although it is through the colonial logic that gender and race are experienced as natural phenomena. Here are in her work, the invention of women making the African sense of Western gender discourse, argues that this naturalization, this naturalization has happened, this naturalization has happened in the interaction between African effective Western feminists in their study of the African space, where she says that, where she argues against this naturalization and that it is the importation of Western concepts such as gender are actually imposed into African studies and societies. The Gones talks of the coloniality of power that would entrench the ways of thinking that would reinforce such hierarchies. The Gones takes notes in analysis and focuses on the interactions of race, gender, class, and sexuality. And it takes note of how women of color and third world feminists have examined the ways in which these interactions are constantly ignored. Here, heterosexualism becomes a perversion that is violently enforced through modern gender system so as to construct a global power. What her analysis offers us is an understanding that, resist, that resistance must be done in such a way that recognizes the various ways in which we are oppressed at a time. This, especially, this is especially important when we work together in our resistance work. Ngoone states, I do not believe any solidarity or homoerotic loving is possible among females who affirm the colonial modern gender system and the coloniality of power. I also think that transnational intellectual and practical work that ignores the implication of the coloniality of power and the colonial modern gender system also affirms this global system of power. This framework allows us a means to understand resistance on the level of complexity that cannot be ignored. And yet I would add another framework work to Longoria's method of understanding. Christina Silvestre uses the image of a traveler to understand this complexity. In her paper, African and Western Feminisms, World Traveling, Tendencies and Possibilities, she calls for a change in which our current emphasis of, of, emphasis of difference be turned into something that is no longer socially ascribed, but a politic. She argues, of a method, she argues for a method of speaking in which across differences, methods by which, by which different identities, feminism, and geospatial locations within them become mobile in the ways that juggle and cross borders without leaving us with baseball caps affixed with Taurus de Carl. I climb Mark and Lujaro with Tanzanian national feminists. The total of Descartes experience is summoning into a lifestyle of feminist adults. So this brings up the image of the tourist who is Western subject centered. Here the journey through the world is one posed as unthreatening and yet the impact can be devastating. The tourist claims to be just passing through and in doing so hiding the impact of their own subjecthood onto the places they visit. In contrast, she introduces the, contrast of the concept of the world traveler and quotes Lungo's description of the experience. Those of us who are world travelers have a distinct experience of being different. 
but to be in a different world and of themselves in there. We can say, that's me there, and I'm happy in the world. The experience is one of having memory of oneself as different without an underlying I. So Vesta argues that this experience relies on empathy, to enter into the world of difference and to find it to echo oneself as the other, and then the way one seems to be. It moves us in other worlds to place to place our subjectivity that shift and hyphenate into the world of the other. Yet one does not act as someone else or pretend to be someone that they are not, performing a Russia. As a traveling state, one is someone who maintains their personality or character and uses space in a particular way. It is in this navigation of oneself that we find our connections with others. Lugones argues that those in a privileged position are not, are not, the, are not your usual world traveler, but as the person outside of dominant society who acquires flexibility from having shifted from themselves, from the dominant construction of life to the constructions where they are more or less at home. Although I agree with such an understanding of a mindset to understand and maneuvering through difference, I do not agree with the clear prescription that the author is giving of, the pre of those in the previous position as being their own clear, distinct category and experience. By understanding the various hierarchical distinctions, we also understand the various levels of privilege that one can be imbued with. The various spaces we travel reveal to us the extent which we can exert power over others and at the same time disempower others. And yet for me, no one embodies this engagement with the world like that of the witch. They are inherently outsiders in their having to engage with dominant knowledge systems whilst at the same time engaging with their occult cosmologies. They both represent the resistance to a neuromodern sense of subjectivity whilst at the same time having to perform them in order to survive in this world. I have found an interesting article in the New Yorker titled The Witches of Baltimore, Young Black Women Are Leaving Christianity and Embracing African Witchcraft with Digital Cards. Here this article delves into the double lives of black women brought up in the Christian faith, but also looking towards the cult practices of the African slave ancestors. An article quotes one such woman, Omitola, who went to a different, who went, who went on to differentiate between African witchcraft and New Age shit, like the witches who gather to ex President Donald Trump and the Supreme Court Justice, Justice Ray Kavanaugh. The study finds that New Age and Christian traditions often coexist in the same person was on full view of the convention. Some witches told me they were finished with Christianity, others say they still attend church, and argue that Christianity and African witchcraft are complementary, not mutually exclusive. As Omotola put it, the Bible ain't nothing but a big book of, but a big old spell book. Yet for me, the striking difference of how this relates to the African South perspective is that we have always held these positions, even though in secret. I think it's no coincidence that the growing popularization of women politics into the mainstream also coincides with the popularization of occult spiritualism. I cannot describe the relationship as that would be a paper on its own. If you can take one thing from my representation, is how the occult can be a tool to resist a world that would deny our humanity. It is in this world of magic that we not only envision a world through media that empowers us to change the world, but also where the souls of our ancestors constantly hold us in love in a world that would seek to tear us apart. Our challenges are of being able to listen to, them, to their wisdom, but also to create spaces where we can listen and teach each other the various ways which we can listen to those who have passed. So I leave you with the words from one of my favorite YouTube channels right now called Sangoma Society. Here, Hani Magwagwa, a Sangoma myself, uses this channel to teach us about African spirituality. I end with her words. Why is it wrong for you to have a sacred space to engage with your ancestors? Even that this sacred space is just a corner for your, of your heart. Truly think about it. Think about everyone else. Every other culture is free to engage with their ancestors, but we as Africans do not. Ours is inherently dirty, filthy, demonic. Why is that? Investigate the colonial project and its effects on the African spirituality. Start doing work even beyond YouTube. That was there again. <laughs> Look into it. Read up on it. I don't know what we have to do, you know. Don't know what we have to do, but we have got to do something. We 
got to start the summary. I don't have all my answers. This is for me the medium where I was guided to do this. And I've been told that this is a community. It is a space to open it. Thank you. is that we can be many things as one. It is both inside, outside, 
outside on. I, and when one considers that, it, it forces you to also be constantly having to do the work on yourself. For me, I may be entering into a research space as an outsider, but in doing that work, I'm actually doing a lot of work on myself. So it almost becomes some form of, uh, one could even say some form of, um, I want to use ritual space in a very loose term, a ritual space in which I have to make my body holy, in a way treated holy, in that I have to realize that it has impact on the outside in which it engages, but also the impact that the outside has on me. And so there's this constantly internal reflection and needing to reflect outward as, as well as in. So I think it is, it is important. In fact, it's not just race, gender, that we should even be, that even are impacting us. In fact, we should be asking the question, what is it that we have not even considered? <coughs> and that for me is the big question. And that for me is where the real mess lies. And so if you find that you're unable, if anything, your methodology, or you should be seeking methodologies that are able to help you handle the mess. Handle the mess not by running away from it, but be able to be like, okay, in fact, when you go into a space, you should be freaking out because there's so many ideas. So you should be looking for methods that are like, okay, how can I center myself and be able to juggle the, the beautiful complexity of life and also be aware that there's a complexity that I have yet which to consider and how I can already be preparing, like we prepare for you know, future generations, we should be preparing for future theories, future experiences within our current understanding. Um, okay, so um, I'm, I'm an insider and I have been all of my life <laughs> well, with uh, charismatic Christianity, um, but I, I have found myself on the outside very, very, very many times um, and uh, I, I try to, to, to find my own, uh, I'd say, spiritual space within that. But then I also I also know that uh, and and with with every every day that that I keep going, whether it's within my spirituality or with my research, that it's not it's not always all about me. That that um, if it that if it affects um, or or shocks or disturbs me, it's probably doing much much worse. Um, to, to someone else who, who could actually be within my, within my space. Um, so yes, I, I, I do consider um, my, my intersectionality, but then I also find myself, and I'm sorry that I'm not answering your question, but I'm giving you more problems to think about. Um, but I also find myself now within this research uh, be because I came, I came at it um, from such a critical point of view. But then I find myself sometimes having to uh, make my stance against scholars who only have a critical view, <laughs> you know, who only have, a, oh my God, they're freaks, they're crazy, they believe in some higher power that's going to um, raise them from the dead, or you know, th that sort of thing. So I, I, I find myself having to um, explain and represent um, my space from an insider point of view, but also acknowledge that there are critiques, that there are things that, are going, that need to be changed, and that when those things are changed, it's very possible that 80% of South Africa is going to be affected by those changes. Um, I mean, I also consider myself um, an insider um, because I work with essentially the women that kind of raised me. Because some of them were um, are in the communities that I grew up in, and so it's that idea where you've been um, so after school that we have to be looked after by mum so and so, mum so and so. So most of them have lived in their houses, not like. As, as a child, but like as someone who's been looked after there. So I am an, an insider in that kind of way, but also an outsider in the sense that I'm also bringing my academic space within their communities as well. So in terms of, um, and also just myself as well, because also they, these are 
grown women who have particular ways of doing things. And then I rock up with my hair and um, my um, different knowledges and different um, educations, right, into their, <laughs> into their um, 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 mostly considered rural spaces. So it, uh, it's also what she was saying about um, um, looking at trying to create new ways of, of, of researching as well within this research, because there are difficult spaces to negotiate when you go into them as yourself, but also as an academic, but also as a community member within those spaces. Um, no, I, like, I, I feel like those aunties are judging me hardcore. Like, I actually blocked my own blessings and some of my research because of my hair. And some certain women didn't want to talk to me, and I would find out afterwards because they would be skinning in there, and then my grandmother would hear, and then she would broken telephone yes. the news to me. And so I definitely hear what you're saying that as much as on paper you could be like tick box, come from there, do this, come from there, but I know these people. But there's a level of outsideness to I think also being young and just you know <laughs> living your life, coming through. And um, for me, I, I felt that strongly like a kind of energy exchange and there's a level of submission and openness I needed to understand that inside of this and outside of this are very fluid things and there was yeah so I needed to just be open to whatever was being presented to me. I just want to add quickly uh, at some point you would feel like an insider, at some point you feel like an outsider. For example, uh, some of the women that I interviewed for my research are based in Luxembourg and they staged a kid when back in 1990. So when I, I come in, I'm an outsider because then they don't trust you. Like, why are you here? Why do you want our stories? Do you just want our stories to go and write a book and publish and make money out of us? Why are you here? You know, so you feel like an outsider. Then when you interview other uh, feminist women, because I, I see myself as other younger women who staged the Kibbutz project. You feel like, okay, we are one. We, we have the same uh, views, the same, um, more or less the same thoughts. So they are more relaxed, more comfortable, and they open up. But when you go to another group, so uh, yeah, sometimes you feel like, okay, I'm an insider. Sometimes you're like, oh, okay, I'm an outsider in this instance. So I feel it's, they intertwine, yeah. We still have uh, three minutes, I think. More questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you came first, uh, Kanata, and then I saw your hand, and then yes. So one, two, three. Yes. Uh, my question is for so Tumi. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to know, what is it like for you to um, get research participants, and how do you present people with your research? And is there any code switching that you have to do? Um, and why do people want to speak to you? when you do research? What's the reason for participating? Um, I'm a pastor's daughter. <laughs> 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 yeah, but you see, that's just the thing. Like, I have to consider my own privilege in that space as well, right? And, um, and, and uh, the dynamics of, of power, because some some of these women are actually talking to me I think because they have to you know like, <laughs> yeah they, they have to but then I, I I do have to work every single day on humbling myself enough for them to understand that it really is a safe a, a safe space that you really can articulate anything that you want to but then it also helps that um, I am sometimes when people are given uh, are feeling brave enough, given uh, the platform at church to speak, mm -hmm. and then I just sound like a mad person to charismatic Christianity because I pray to a genderless God. I I I speak against praying to a white God, you know. So uh, and uh, so those, those when when I ask those sort of questions um, on a pulpit, then the women do actually think, okay, she is crazy enough to open up to, and then, and then I, I, I find my connection with them. Oh, and code, oh, code switching, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do. I code switch all the time. Uh, sorry, I'd forgotten that part of your question. Yeah, I do code switch all the time, but then it's not, it's not just um, um, at church where, obviously, if I'm having this conversation, yeah, I'm going to have to link it to one or other scripture in the Bible just to, to justify it as true and as godly. Um, but uh, I, I, I've, I've given, I've presented my research to different groups. Um, the last one was a, a group of, of theologians, so I had to be very technical about um, what, you know, what, and, and they, they talk about dogmas and, uh, you know, uh, yeah, so all of that sort of language, I, I had to work my way around it. And then when I get to um, spaces where it's media and communication, I have to explain it to them according to what they see on TV or, or on the internet or read in the newspapers and so on. But here, yeah, I can just talk. <laughs> so yeah, there is some, some code cool switching that I do. Okay, second question, please. Oh, uh, I'm interested in, the, in these interactions uh, and the snowball effect that it has on the communities and how itself, it in itself is processes. So what have you guys noticed in, you know, like what has mm -hmm. happened to those communities after you've gone through mm -hmm. those processes, these interactions with them? It's the question for everyone. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go. Um, um, what I've noticed, I think, and, and I have liked is, is the idea that um, after we've had these um, workshop um, com um, conversations, is that how they are now able to, without me being present and me um, constantly trying to probe them to speak, are able to speak in other platforms when, where I'm not there and where they are actually not even be working. Um, so, so that's for me has changed in. in, in, in Oh, sorry. And I um, kind of made a little document um, summarizing the research as well as giving them the full research. Um, and these were the temple trustees. I had their emails and that was that. Um, and in this document to them, I kind of highlighted certain aspects where I was like, I'm fully on board to like talk further about this, or we can speak to FAMSA, we can speak to advice desk for the views that operates in Durban. We can get things going because there are organizations that deal with um, abuse survivors, just ignore you know, everything in the area. No comment. Mm -hmm. But because all my family's in Durban, I go there often. So I went to the temple, I found one of the uncles, and he was just, you know, kind of doddering around. And I think in their <laughs> minds, they're waiting on me to kind of facilitate something or do something. Um, they have seen what I what my research is about, but it hasn't led to any kind of tangible changes as yet. But yeah, the future is big. Mm -hmm. Did you always take the next question? The last question, because we've run out of time. The last question for me, uh, which is of interest to me. <laughs> um, I was just thinking when she is uh, she's going through all the uh, uh, changing around the issues of Christianity. Uh, recently, I just uh, read a book from uh, Jacqueline Batimon, Batalora. Bat it was talking about uh, the invention of a white race. So taking us to the 1600, how the the people that today we see as white people did not exist, but it was a construct, a social construct that we respond to. And in those levels of those constructs of divide and rule, one of the things that came later systematically or not to control the people was to come up with religion and it was Christianity. So from those times, to be a Christian is to be white. And, 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 and when you say that you are Christian, that means you are saying that you are you are white as in, in terms of the social construct of white privacy and getting the benefit to the civil society. So I'm interested on now, because now when that came, I was thinking, is it one of the things that 
you know, sometimes when you say someone that you're not a Christian, or someone that you say that they're a Christian, they're talking from the, the supremacy of thinking that they are higher than other people because of that contrast. So it should be interesting now because the charismatic uh, church is the way to, it's, a, it's a movement from the first conception of religion and Christianity to another way it is understanding of modernity and change. So personally, more of the Christian uh, uh, charismatic is more capitalist in time more than in those ones that you see in the other mainstream religions. So for me it would be interesting also to I don't know how you will <laughs> try to see all these things because it's a, it's a, it's a, I want to just say we, we, we live in the illusion of the construct of things that makes us behave and a certain attitude. How you look at that and try to make sense on how people behave and what are they responding to? Yeah. To the internal supremacy that comes under the banner of feeling under Christianity. It's complex. I don't even know how to say this, but that for me, Triggered uh, part of the interest of understanding you know, what it looks as a simple thing that is more deeper, especially in its construction. Um, I'm actually glad that you um, that you came with all the, the, the complexities um, of 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 the, the the history of Christianity and and uh, where we are now, because now I'm, I'm just thinking on, on very practical levels. Um, charismatic Christianity is seen as this uh, sort of a, a militant uh, way of, of doing Christianity, right? Um, just um, in the way in, in the way that you, um, you're, you're taught to pray and and to claim the to claim things for yourself, you know. So that already has uh, there, there is already that 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 um, supremacy that is going on there. Um, and, and I haven't, I, I, I've, I, I have uh, challenged um, what, what's called the prosperity, the, the prosperity gospel on those lines um, and have looked at um, the, uh, the, the history of, of, of Christianity, not from your angle exactly, but from um, the, the stance that the, the Bible has been used for very long over time as a tool of, of oppression or of uh, destructions of, of, of identities um, and, and so on. So yeah, it is a, it is a negotiation that, that I go into and try to help others go into too, but I, I don't think that I can uh, quite fully explain where where my stand is now, except for the simple fact that even calling myself a charismatic Christian, I again do not pray to a white God, and my God is genderless. You know, so um, yeah, I think we can discuss it further and really dig into yeah. it at. at as, as we keep going through um, the next few days. Okay, I'm going to give you a chance that they, we're going to go. Because I'm feeling time. left yeah. out. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> just to add to this, you having to take this, I don't think a stand is necessary. So as I'm doing my research on the occult, I had to, there's a chapter I read in which the Christian links to the occult. Yes. And so I found, the, and I found the most amazing thing called the Gnostics. Now these guys were crazy. Right. We're talking about not just one god, various gods. In fact, it's like it's a whole, in fact, the cosmology is very similar to how we understand African cosmology. Keeping that in mind, that when the creation of the Bible, then there were, and, and if anything, when you got Rome and the creation of state, well, empire, certain things had to be done to the Bible because now it's being used as a tool of power. Certain chapters go, some stay, blah, 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 blah. and so, the, exactly the translation of politics. <laughs> and so if you look at this history whereby, and the same goes for Islam, and it goes, there's always this history of the text whereby you got your crazy ones who just go out there, you know, and then you got the ones who are like, they specifically situate themselves with power. But even those crazy ones who claim to move outside of power, they themselves actually start affirming power in their own way. Mm. I think it's not about having to make a stand, actually. Mm. It's not about saying this is better, that is better. 
I think it's just about looking and just understanding the craziness and doing your history and just seeing when a person tells you, do you Christian, you tell them, but do you Christian? And you tell them this history that is going to be like, pew. Yeah. yeah. And please look at the, the ZCC <laughs> and apostolic churches in relation to the occult. Because I've never